Christ taught that the secrets of the synagogue of Satan would be exposed in the last days. Christ was a threat to the synagogue of Satan because he revealed many of the occult practices. In part one of this series, we zeroed in on the origins of the Kabbalah, demonology, and the Star of David. In this volume, we will delve deeper into the mysterious and perverse teachings of the Zohar. Before I pursued my research on the Kabbalah, I was already familiar with the occult, but when I singled out the Zohar for research, I quickly recognized that this is Satan's creme de la creme of the occult. Perhaps you too will notice this fascinating revelation. The whole dualistic system of good and evil powers, which goes back to Zoroastrianism and ultimately to Old Chaldea, can be traced through Gnosticism, having influenced the cosmology of the ancient Kabbalah before it reached the medieval one. So is the conception underlying the Kabbalistic tree, of the right side being the source of light and purity, and the left the source of darkness and impurity. Luria clearly took a significant step beyond the intellectual world of the Zohar in that he found the starting point of evil not in one or another point in the Sephirotic structure but in the very act of God's self-contraction within his own being. The evil inclination never leaves man from the day of his birth. The good inclination comes to man only when he seeks purity. And when does man seek purity? On his thirteenth birthday, man joins with the good inclination on the right and the evil inclination of the left. They are literally two appointed angels found constantly with man. The Old and New Testament told us much regarding the nature of Yahweh. He is presented as holy, merciful, just, and good. Evil cannot be found in him. The Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. Yahweh also promises to create within us a mind to do what is right. This is not the case with the gods of the Kabbalah and the occult world. They embrace a satanic dualism where God is both good and evil. Many people find this hard to digest. So to make it palatable, the occultist gives the nebulous explanation for the existence of evil. People of this serpentine religion say the purpose of evil is to reveal his goodness. Light would be incomprehensible without darkness to make it manifest by contrast. Good would be no good without evil to show the priceless nature of the boon. And so personal virtue could claim no merit 
unless it had passed through the furnace of temptation. Eliphas Levy in his occult classic The History of Magic accentuates this diabolical dualism in a stealthy way. Seeing that, according to the most exalted interpretation of the great hermetic dogma, hell is the equilibrating reason of heaven, for harmony results from the analogy of contraries. Satan is the author of this poisonous dualism. It was entwined in his Sermon of Enlightenment in Genesis chapter 3 verse 4 to 7 and its enduring lie is preserved in the Zohar, the king of all mystery religions. In fact, there can be no true worship except it issue forth from darkness and no true good except it proceed from evil. Hence, the perfection of all things is attained when good and evil are first of all commingled and then become all good, for there is no good so perfect as that which issues out of evil. And the Lord formed the man with both good and evil inclination. Observe, he said, that the Holy One, blessed be He, made a right and a left for the ruling of the world. The one is called good, the other evil, and He made man to be a combination of the two. The principles of Marxism are also found in the Kabbalah. Rabbi Harry Watton draws an interesting parallel between the Kabbalah and Karl Marx's blueprint for communism. No idea is more productive of a deeper insight into existence than the idea of dialectics. The law of dialectics postulates that all conducts in time turns into its opposite. The Kabbalah expresses this thought as follows. There is no light but that which comes out from darkness, for when this side of darkness is subordinated, then ascends the Holy One in the high and is glorified, and there is no work of the Holy One but from darkness, and there is no good but from evil. How can we explain in history why individualism must give way to collectivism, and how competition can bring out cooperation? The possibility thereof, nay, the inevitability of this dialectic movement, constitutes the essence of the Marxian philosophy. How can we hope to understand this process without the law of dialectics? Marx borrowed the notion of an historical dialectic from Hegel's and applied this concept to history from his point of view. There are also many parallels in Hegel's lecture on the philosophy of religion with the Luranic Kabbalah. Like the Kabbalists, Hegel understands the Absolute as evolving through the distinct phases, which ultimately results in the creation of the world and man. Indeed, Hegel's description of at least the early stages of divine evolution closely echoes the views of the Theosophical Kabbalah. In his lectures on the philosophy of religion, Hegel recognizes a moment in the history of the deity in which it is completely unknown. Hegel tells that this idea is prominent in the history of religious speculation, noting that Philo, a Jewish Platonist, defines God as the Ovi, as what has being, in other words, the hidden God who is unknowable, uncommunicative, inconceivable. Hegel informs us that this moment in divine evolution is also spoken of as the Eternal One whose dwelling is in the inexpressible heights and who is exalted above all contact. If Hegel's first moment or definition of God is very similar to the Kabbalist's first sephira, Keter, or Ayin, his second definition echoes the Kabbalist's second sephira, Hakma. To justify the Kabbalist view of theodicy, the Zohar presents evil as an innocuous instrument of God to cleanse sinners. Evil is there simply in order to increase man's chances. Because God wanted man to be free, he ordained the real existence of evil, that he might prove his moral strength in overcoming it. It is the desire of the Holy One, blessed be He, that men should serve Him continually and walk in the path of truth, so that He might reward them with many good things. 
Now since this is the desire of the Holy One, blessed be he, how can the wicked servant come and object to his master's desire, and persuade men to take an evil path, and force them away from the good path, and make them disobedient to their Lord? But he is actually doing the will of his master. In his attempt to persuade man to break the commandments, the evil inclination is acting as an agent of God. From the last quote, it would appear that Satan plays a very important part in our redemption. Here is another example of Lucifer's creation of the Zohar to attack the God of the Bible. The Bible says, God is not responsible for man's temptations. Temptation originates with the devil. The choice is ours, whether we give allegiance to him or Yahweh. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then, when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. You decide whether the God of the Kabbalah is similar in nature to Lucifer. The theory of evolution accords with the series of Kabbalah better than any other theory. Evolution follows a path of ascent and thus provides the world with a basis for optimism. How can one despair, seeing that everything evolves and ascends? When we penetrate the inner nature of evolution, we find divinity illuminated in perfect clarity. Einsof generates, actualizes potential infinity. The concept of evolution did not originate with Charles Darwin. It has been the essential ingredient of all pagan religions and philosophies from time immemorial. For example, Optimism, Pantheism, Stoicism, Gnosticism, and all other humanistic and polytheistic systems all beliefs which assume the ultimacy of the space-time-matter-universe, presupposing that the universe has existed from eternity, are fundamentally evolutionary systems. The cosmos, with its innate laws and forces, is the only ultimate reality. From this perspective, it becomes obvious that most of the great world religions, Buddhism, Confucianism, Taoism, Hinduism, Animism, are based on evolution. This is attested to in two books which have left an indelible mark upon the occult. It will be an easy task to show that the cosmogonical legends all over the world are based on a knowledge by the ancients of those sciences which have allied themselves in our days in support of the doctrine of evolution and that further research may demonstrate that those ancients were far better acquainted with the fact of evolution itself embracing both its physical and spiritual aspects than we are now the occultists of the ancient world had a most remarkable understanding of the principle of evolution. They recognized all life as being in various stages of becoming. They believed that grains of sand were in the process of becoming human. The ancients maintained that the universe was a great living organism, not unlike the human body and that every phase and function of the universe body had a correspondence in man. This New Age Babylonian religion is taught in our schools under the guise of evolution. 
Millennia before Charles Darwin, people in shamanic cultures were convinced that humans and animals were related. Judging from the material that we have, the Babylonians seem to have believed in a kind of evolution, for they evidently regarded the first creative powers, the watery waste and the abyss, as the rude and barbaric beginnings of things, the divine powers produced from these first principles. When the West brought Darwin's pseudo-beliefs to India, it gave credence to their worship of the monkey god Hanuman. In gratitude for this important finding, so unexpectedly confirming their ancient legend, they very nearly promote philologists to the rank of the gods. Darwin climaxed this whole subject. With the spread of Western education and scientific literature in India, the people became more than ever convinced that we are the descendants of their Henuman, monkey god. Once that science, in the person of Darwin, supports the wisdom of the Aryans, there is nothing left for us to do but to submit. And, surely, it is better to have Hanuman, the poet, the hero and the god, for a forefather, than some other monkey. According to Hindu cosmology, the origin of all things was a vast expanding centrifugal force or explosion, which today we call the Big Bang. The principle of this explosion that gives birth to the world is called Shiva. The Big Bang theory of modern scientists is strikingly similar to the way some Jewish mystics describe the creation. For if the Big Bang theory is accurate, scientists may be confirming the creation myths of the Jewish and Hindu mystics. Just as science has confirmed the ideas behind Jewish and Hindu creation myths, so it has lent credibility to other statements Jewish mystics have made about the universe. While the groundwork was laid to persuade people that evolution was a science, the world of the occult was being hardened in their myths. Added to the equation of evolution was the notion that if we had evolved from matter to human, then the last stage is from human to being a god. Once this lie had gained acceptance, the time was ripe for Lucifer's genesis of lies. You shall evolve and be as gods. Everybody from Jesus Christ to Adolf Hitler would be seen as someone who we can identify with because we are all one. I think that certainly there is every potential for all of us as spiritual beings to merge as one. We've mastered the evolution of the physical body. We've mastered the evolution of the mind, or we're moving in that direction. So we're coming to a time where we're using this perfected, quasi-perfected body, this opening and, and perfecting mind, to access the true perfection of the universe, which is the spiritual dimension. And that's, I think, our purpose on Earth, and I think we're understanding that, is to make ourselves whole, to become one with ourselves, and then to realize our godhood. I believe that everyone has Christ consciousness within themselves and all they need to do is go inside and realize that and bring it forward and be that Christ consciousness. This, the evolution of man into Superman, was always the purpose of the ancient mysteries. Man, who has sprung from the earth and developed through the lower kingdoms of nature to his present rational state, has yet to complete his evolution by becoming a godlike being and unifying his conscience with the omniscient. While natural selection does not adequately describe the inner development of humans, especially since it has been interpreted materially, yet evolution is not just a scientific theory of the development of life forms, but a great cosmic principle describing the development of consciousness. Many researchers now espouse the ageless wisdom teaching that consciousness precedes matter and that the material universe is the outer, dense expression of divine consciousness, the outer embodiment of a divine idea. Darwin was a pawn in the game of Satan to erode people's confidence in the Bible. All the previous religions we have mentioned that have similarities with the theory of evolution also have parallel beliefs with the Kabbalah. 
This is why the liberal Kabbalists romanticize evolution in their publications. Our civilization has been transformed over the past century and a half in no small part by our acceptance of a new tale of origins, one that began with Darwin and is refined daily by the work of life scientists and physicists. Scientists are the new Kabbalists of our age, claiming even to know the black hole out of which being itself came to be, speculating on the first few seconds of existence, as our ancestors once did on the highest triad of the ten sephirot, or rungs, of divine being. The New Age Kabbalists fell for Satan's first lie. The following quotes will show how they apotheosized themselves. God places himself for display upon earth in the likeness of the Jew. The Hebrew is the living God, the God become flesh, the heavenly man, the Adam Kadmon. The soul of a Jew is truly a part of God above. Not only do the New Age Kabbalists claim that they can become gods, Rabbi Yehuda in the Zohar says that in the near future, they will have power to create worlds and raise the dead. In the name of the Rav, Rabbi Yehuda said that in the future, the righteous will create worlds and raise the dead. In the latter part of the 13th century, Rabbi Abraham Abulafia was one of the most important mystical teachers in the history of Kabbalah. He was not universally accepted because he decided to disseminate the knowledge of the Kabbalah in his numerous writings. The few who had kept this knowledge strictly for the adepts were not pleased with this. Abulafia spent a great portion of his life practicing and teaching ecstatic vision a Judaized form of yoga and gematria. Abulafia lays down certain rules of body posture, certain corresponding combinations of consonants and vowels, and certain forms of recitation, and in particular some passages of his book, The Light of the Intellect, gives the impression of a Judaized treatise of yoga. The similarity even extends to some aspects of the doctrine of ecstatic vision as preceded and brought about by these practices. From the earliest times up until today, many Jews have gravitated towards syncretism, incorporating many pagan practices into their religion. This syncretism began with the rebellion against the teachings of Moses and the prophets up until the time of Christ. Spiritually bankrupt, some of them seek spiritual fulfillment through yoga. Apparently, Diana is far from alone in her quest to blend her yoga and Jewish practices. Jewish yoga hybrids have sprouted up everywhere, from a Miami synagogue that offers a yoga breath and Jewish prayer workshop to a Rosh Kadesh woman's yoga group that meets in Manhattan. A television producer in Manhattan, Jody Williams, who considers herself a spiritual and cultural Jew, has practiced yoga regularly for the past three years. Hasn't Judaism survived against all odds precisely because it has remained flexible enough to adapt to the needs of its followers? In their quest for Canaanite enlightenment, many Jews around the world, already interested in the Kabbalah, are fascinated with Hinduism, Buddhism, and Tai Chi. 
Jews crop up ubiquitously around Dharma Masala in meditation and yoga courses, Reiki workshops, Tai Chi sessions, and Buddhist lectures. Many Jews and Israelis come to seek answers in the great spiritual bazaar of India. Hindu Fakir Sai Baba in Shirdi draws many with his religious universalism, as does the commune of the late Guru Osho in Pune. But most Jewish seekers make pilgrimage to Dharmasala. Buddhism is hot, and Tibetan Tantra Buddhism is even hotter. It's esoteric and mystical, exotic and colorful. This past Yom Kippur, he, Aitan Turkel, a religious Jew enrolled in Yeshiva in India, trotted down the hill from Dharamakot to listen to the Dalai Lama in a public audience at his monastery in Dharamasala. Then he legged it back up to the Jewish service at the local Chabad outpost. I feel I can take a lot from Buddhism and use it in my Judaism without becoming a Buddhist. This last sentence from Ethan Turkle is worth repeating. I feel I can take a lot from Buddhism and use it in my Judaism without becoming a Buddhist. When I read this, I asked myself this question. What is it about Judaism that retains many Jews while they practice other religions? The answer is that many branches of Judaism teach that Jews are superior to other nations. This is why they will have no problem borrowing the beliefs of other nations, creating a hybrid Judaism. National ambition, however, rather than eclecticism, influenced the Jews, and though it was impossible, having regard to their environment, that they should not be tinctured largely, it was their object to tinge other systems and not to modify their own, to shew that the ethnic philosophers owed everything to the divine doctrine of Palestine. It is precisely the existence of this transitional stage which alone accounts for all the phenomena we are studying, a stage in which there was real Jewish syncretism, but which was succeeded by one of assimilation of pagan ideas and forms into Judaism itself, while pagan names and mythology were finally rejected. A clone form of Kabbalistic yoga today is called Ophanim in which you twist your body into the shape of Hebrew letters. There are those who say that the mysteries of the universe can be unlocked with a practice of yoga called Ophanim, in which you twist your body into the shapes of Hebrew letters, based on a theory of Jewish mysticism that claims the universe was created when God spoke the Hebrew alphabet, Ophanic, which his practitioners translate as angels of form, is built on the idea that each letter is a conduit for divine energy and has a corresponding yoga posture. By practicing these postures, the theory goes, you can connect with the letters associated physical and emotional strengths. Mr. Kolos, who had a bar mitzvah but grew up without much of a religious background, said Ophanim has helped him return to his faith. He is able to read Hebrew again and is connecting with the essence of Judaism, he said. The two other students of Ophanim I spoke with concurred. It's been part of my whole reawakening, said Rand Marsh. I do Hatha Yoga and Tibetan Yoga, and the Hebrew letter yoga is the most powerful yoga form I've done. Cindy Wachker, who has studied yoga before, but has only begun taking Ophanim with Mr. Kolos, said she was attracted to it because of the Jewish content. While on the subject of yoga, it should be noted as well that many Christian spiritualists deny the outward appearance of yoga, yet their teachings and experiences are similar to Kundalini yoga. Throughout the world today, there are many so-called evangelists who are claiming that they have these supernatural powers in which uh, they're able to transfer these new gifts. Uh, people will laugh and shake, twitch, fall over, jump up and down like they're on pogo sticks, some laughing hysterically, some even behaving like animals. And these people claim that they are bartenders of the Holy Spirit. They're able to give this anointing away. Now the question is, is this biblical? Where in the scriptures do we find that in the last days, 
people will laugh hysterically in the church. Where do we find that people will behave like animals, roar like lions, bark like dogs, crow like roosters, and that this would be a sign that this is of the Spirit of God? I do not find this anywhere in the scriptures at all. And this is why I am deeply troubled and concerned regarding what is taking place in the church. I believe that many people are being convinced that they are receiving the Holy Spirit when it's not the Holy Spirit, and they're actually being deceived, and they're opening the door for a delusion which was preparing the way for the Antichrist. Although there are many people today in the world embracing these strange kinds of behavior, uh, the shaking, the twitching, uh, the jumping up and down like they're on pogo sticks, or this uh, unusual laughing, hysterical laughing, or even animal behavior, claiming that this is something new, that this is from God, I find no basis for this kind of behavior as something that is given to us by the Holy Spirit. It's not found in the Bible. But we can find in the literature a description of this kind of behavior as something which comes from what's called the serpent power, the kundalini. Uh, for example, I have in my hand here a book called The Stormy Search for Self by Groff and Groff, psychotherapists. And on page 78 and 79, they describe what happens to people who are overcome by the serpent power. Quote, individuals involved in this process, that is the kundalini, might find it difficult to control their behavior. During powerful rushes of kundalini energy, they often emit various involuntary sounds and their bodies move in strange and unexpected patterns. Among the most common manifestations of this kind are unmotivated and unnatural laughter or crying, talking in tongues, singing previously unknown songs and spiritual chants, assuming yogic postures and gestures, and imitating a variety of animal sounds and movements. So here in a book, which describes occultic behavior, we find all of the symptoms of what we're seeing today in the church where people are claiming this is a gift from God. I don't find any basis in the Word of God for this kind of behavior, but I do find a basis in the literature describing occultic Rajneesh says his goal is to create a new man, one who is happily mindless. <laughs> Of that anointing. We got there. Yeah. We got there.
This is called dynamic meditation. This violent frenzy continues on and on, creating a mind-altering form of hyperventilation. Wild movement alternates with periods of utter stillness. Can't copy it. <laughs> I didn't ask for this. No, I, I didn't. The problem was when I came through the doors in November '94, and the Lord said to me, What do you want, John? I said, I want to get drunk. But I forgot to tell him for how long. <laughs> mm. Now, I don't mind being drunk. It's great. But I said to the Lord, Lord, I don't like looking drunk. You know, your eyes get bloodshot. And... and he said to me, John, you see, some of you think God doesn't talk like that, but he's very, he's a fun God. Let's get the fun back into church. And he said, John, you see the rock stars when they're on the TV the next morning being interviewed on breakfast TV? Do you notice they always wear sunglasses? So he said, Get yourself a pair of sunglasses. <laughs> I call these glasses glory shades. No. I'm sure Moses would have wore them if they had sunglasses in the Old Testament. Now, hang in, please. This is a moment when many Americans have become disenchanted with the demands of organized religion and more interested in a spirituality that asks less of their time and allows for a direct relationship with God. The fastest growing faiths are the most exotic and spiritual. The popularity of evangelical churches exploded. Membership in Pentecostal Christianity grew by 400% in the Southern Baptist churches by 54%. There are sociologists who say America is in the middle of its fourth great awakening. A 1997 Newsweek poll found that 54% of Americans pray every day but many are disenfranchised from an organized church and see religion not as an inherited given, but rather as the old pick and choose Chinese menu. The Promise Keepers and the Vineyard, for example, mix Christianity with self-help. Many Christians are into Eastern religions. I included in my treatise on the Kabbalah, Counterfeit Christianity, 
because there is an organized attempt by proponents of the New Age to neutralize the teachings of Christ by injecting Eastern mysticism. A leaderless but powerful network is working to bring about radical change in the United States. This network is the Aquarian Conspiracy. In the Old Testament, many Israelites lost their battle with Eastern mysticism, still wanting to be Yahweh's chosen people. They blended Eastern mysticism with the teachings of the Torah. The metamorphosis of this is the Kabbalah. You have abandoned your people, the house of Jacob. They are full of superstitions from the East. They practice divination like the Philistines and clasp hands with pagans.